Our next session is with a great leader and global transformation officer for Red Hat. Jay Bloom has been working to illuminate and improve the complex interactions between design, development, and operational excellence in organizations for more than 20 years. He's an experienced executive leader of software and product development companies serving in numerous executive roles, including chief architect, principal technical director, chief technical officer, and chief social technical officer. Jabe is, is a part of the Red Hat Global Transformation Office, a consultancy that focuses on applying scientific and desi design research methodologies to enable exploration, increase flow, improve software engineering, and enable operational excellence. Jabe, please join us, turn on your camera, join us. We're excited to have you here. Hi there, Jabe. Hello, how are you? Good to see you today. Very good. Honored to have you here. I'm going to exit now, let you share your presentation and guide you through this journey. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Cool. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about uh, what I call the three economies model. Um, it's a way of working in an organization to enable efficiency without um, impacting your efficacy in the marketplace. Um, just really quickly, um, I work at uh, Red Hat, uh, the Global Transformation Office. I'm getting a PhD at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the research that I do uh, at Carnegie Mellon informs a lot of the work I do at Red Hat. Um, and I, the type of research I do there is called action research. Uh, I can talk more about that in the future. Is there a reason this says pause? I don't think you're in presentation mode yet. Now, now it looks like you may have moved that way. Now it looks like it is. Thank you. Every time I go into presentation mode, it says pause. This is um, okay. Just one second. Sorry, folks. Um, okay, so these are my uh, uh, co-workers at Red Hat, um, Andrew Clay Schaefer, um, uh, uh, Kevin Baer, um, John Willis. Uh, we started about uh, eight months ago. Uh, the group of, of people to my left in the picture have all written bunches of books together um, and uh, published extensively. Oh my goodness, this is frustrating. <sighs> Looks good. Uh, now, I got it. I got it. I, I got it. Yep. Thanks. Uh, so uh, Andrew, Andrew is the uh, head of the Global Transformation Office. Um, he uh, is widely recognized as being one of the people who uh, started the DevOps movement, uh, focusing on the DevOps days. Uh, John Willis, uh, I think has spoken more uh, DevOps days than any any person on the planet. Uh, great guy, uh, wrote uh, beyond uh, worked on Beyond the Phoenix Project, wrote uh, DevOps Handbook. Kevin Bear was co-author of uh, the Phoenix Project, um, and I've had uh, the luck of working with him for about the last eight years uh, at a company called Praxis Flow that we started. So let, let's get into the presentation really quickly. Um, what, what is an economy? Uh, well, an economy really is ju just the idea that we have some sort of uh, limited set of resources and we want to distribute those resources across um, an organization in order to maximize the value of them. Uh, so the question is, with, with an economy is simply, given what we have, how do we maximize the value of having it or uh, selling it in the marketplace? Um, you will note that I have said economies. So there's three economies in this presentation. So one of the ways to think about that is that most people tend to think of the economy uh, as in like uh, the marketplace. Uh, in, in this presentation, what we're talking about is kind of the logics uh, of how you might deploy resources. And the point of the presentation in a large way is to say that there's actually three separate 
types of logic that you might use uh, to deploy those resources in front of an organization. Um, and then, then the question ends up being, how do we maximize the value if we use three different forms of economic theory as opposed to a single economic theory? Um, so let's, let's explore really quickly why this is important. I think uh, most people will recognize this basic problem. Um, uh, in most organizations, we have kind of like one side of the house, which might, you might call kind of development or product development. And what they want to do is accelerate differentiation. And they really, really want to concentrate on the creation of new value. That's the, their primary focus. Yeah? And on the other side of the house, uh, we often have some focus on operational excellence. So maximizing the value of things that we own or can deploy in the marketplace um, and uh, focus on efficiency. So uh, constantly trying to create more value out of the assets we already have um, by reducing the cost of maintaining them. And so uh, we get these kind of basic structures inside of organizations. A lot of organizations, what we see is kind of a, 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 a bifurcation in the middle of the organization between central IT, some sort of centralized uh, governance body uh, running all sorts of kind of methodologies and governance processes for kind of controlling consumption um, and, you know, making best practices available and really focused on, on doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Uh, but being able to really maximize the value of uh, having a repeatable process there. On the other side of that house, we often have multiple business lines, product lines, or agile teams. And their primary focus is almost always on getting more customers. And not only just getting more customers, but getting into new markets, addressing new types of customers. And so the fact that they're trying to constantly kind of niche themselves into new parts of the market, find new ways of being in the market, means that they're always trying to do things differently. So you can see already this kind of schism forming between uh, the two parts of the organization. And the, the, the same pro, uh, uh, paradox could be shown um, even more deeply if we go look at the actual monetization of these things. So when we look at What's happening uh, inside of your uh, development side of the house, what you're trying to do is increase revenue, you're really uh, trying to increase conversion, uh, create new markets, uh, optimize pricing, all these types of things. And that means that we're trying to constantly create new features, new versions, new projects, new products, um, and constantly increasing variety. On the other side of the house, we have kind of uh, operational margin improvement. So really, how do we get more value from the things that we already have? How do we get more value from the uh, customers we already serve? How do we serve our customers with less cost to us and lower the cost to them in order to stay competitive in a market? Um, so what we're looking at here is more about asset efficiency and we did CapEx, OpEx, and uh, the number of employees in, involved, all those types of things end up being what's focused on. And the, the normal way of kind of thinking through that is what we need to do is decrease variation inside the system. We need to like minimize the number of different um, types of Linux that we're running or number of different uh, installations that we have um, in order to really maximize the value of kind of the reproducibility of the system. In DevOps, uh, this was the kind of traditional way of thinking of this problem. Uh, we call it the wall of confusion. And, and the wall of confusion is, is a traditional way of kind of thinking through how to solve these two economies, these, the, the change, that's, the, the conflict that's happening here. And the way that most organizations solve that is that they create a policy wall. They create a, a significant uh, set of um, uh, governing policies and processes uh, that prevent the change that's being generated on the development side of the house from arriving at, on the operations side of the house. And of course, what ends up happening here is that the organization kind of slows down. Uh, and because the two economic logics both actually make sense um, to, them, to the people who are being kind of incented by them, there's also like a, a sense in which both sides of the house don't really understand each other. They don't understand what they're trying to achieve 
because the mathematical logic that's driving their behavior, efficiency versus effect, efficacy, is actually opposed uh, to to themselves. They, they cannot be resolved directly, right? Um, so what we end up with is this idea of two different economies, uh, that there's two economic logics at play. We have on one side, an economic logic that is trying to create value by increasing market addressability, and we call that economy the economy of differentiation. And on the other side, we have uh, an economy of scale, uh, traditional scale economy theory, which is uh, focused on the idea that value is created by efficiency and by the uh, efficient uh, value is created by efficiency of the purchasing and deployment of uh, infrastructure um, and other ideas like that. We get two sides of the same uh, organization. Uh, the weird kind of cone shape back there has to do with the way in which variation changes across the organization so that what we can see is that there's a there's a high value in variation um, in the differentiation economy and a low value of variation in the, the scale economy. Just keep it in mind as you see it in these different pictures. So the nice thing about paradoxes like this um, is that they allow us to start having conversation inside of our organizations about how to um, solve for this. Um, in the traditional two economy framing, this kind of efficiency versus eth efficacy argument, um, what ends up happening is what one side has to lose. It's, it's a zero sum game. There's there's only one side can win because of the way that argument is framed around differentiation or, um, or similarity reductive variation. So the question is, can we kind of come up with a way of pointing out that this paradox isn't truly paradoxical? And in fact, there's a way in which we can create a win-win uh, uh, in which organizations can develop and have both uh, an ability to accelerate market differentiation and an ability to efficiently create and um, maintain the infrastructure that they own. So that's where the three economies model comes in. And the economy we're going to add is this, is this idea of what's called the economy of scope. Uh, and we'll talk a, a lot about it uh, this afternoon or this morning, uh, depending where you are. Um, but the, the main difference here, the thing to be really kind of focused on is that uh, the difference between scale and scope, which is often confused. So in the way that we use these theories, scale is a uh, scale applies to theories, uh, uh, scale applies to the management of resources that can be consumed. So what do I mean by that? Uh, in, in IT, there are certain resources that can be consumed, uh, things like uh, your CPU pool, your network, uh, your storage. All, all these uh, physical devices in your organization or uh, that you are leasing or renting from another organization by some sort of cloud provider, um, all those things uh, can be overused. That, and therefore, they require a certain set of governing processes in order to prevent their overuse and to plan for their future use. So how much are we going to need next year? So kind of growth and resource planning problems. The, those types of uh, resources require that type of um, governance because if they're just kind of given out to your organization willy-nilly, uh, they, they will impact the organization um, poorly when the system goes down. And, uh, Kind of critically, we're really in uh, another kind of important part of what's happening currently is that um, it used to be that you, you, your team would get an individual server um, and maybe the network could be overloaded. But really, uh, if you did something bad, uh, if you overused your resources, the, the only people who would be impacted would be you. Your, your server would be impacted. But now when we talk about kind of cloud native liquid um, markets of CPU uh, compute, um, we're, if we overuse the compute pool, it affects everyone. It's not just your, um, your particular application that will go down. So auto scaling and, and things like this could impact not just you, but the, the entire organization. So the governance of those kind of critical consumable resources is really important. 
On the other hand, there's a, a whole set of uh, resources that you, any organization has that are not consumed in use. Uh, and this is the uh, importance of the scope economy. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, if you have, for instance, uh, 20 different development teams and all of them are kind of developing either variations or different applications, um, and they all have kind of data silos, so they all have their own customer record. Well, if you want to know like how many customers does your enterprise have as opposed to how many customers does this application have, you have to figure out how to get the customer record out of those data silos, consolidate it, uh, dedupe it, um, and clean it up in order to be able to make a report and say how many customers you actually have. Um, unique customers, that is. So this, uh, in, in many organizations, ends up being like a batch process, and it is used primarily for reporting purposes. On the other hand, um, if you uh, if you somehow created a, a place in which that customer record was shared among the 20 teams, not kind of data siloed into 20 teams, so that they could update and consume that shared resource, uh, they would uh, benefit from it. And not only that, but the more teams that used that, that centralized um, shared resource, the more people that use that customer record, the more valuable it would become both to the organization and to the end customer himself. Uh, so scope uh, economies have to do with maximizing the use of uh, resources that are not consumed. And those things are, include things like uh, data structures, uh, well-formed functions. So you could think of like microservices um, or serverless functions um, and patterns uh, of utilization and consumption. So you can think about things like cognitive patterns, uh, the way in which your platform is consumed at, at, in, in your business, things like that. All of those things are examples of resources your organization has that would be suboptimally deployed if they were deployed in, using scale style governance. Because scale style governance is, is, decided, is decidedly designed to prevent people from using things. Uh, and in this case, the whole point of, of these things is that the more people that use them, the better they are for the people that are involved. So what we end up with is this kind of like three economies that are based on these three high level ideas of like creating novelty, creating more shared resources that are increase in value with use and creating efficiency of consumable resources. So differentiation, scope, scale. Uh, we can see that this means that we end up having kind of different focuses uh, of our, our development efforts uh, in these three different places. Uh, your development teams, your, your software, uh, your, sorry, your product development teams are really heavily focused on novel value creation. Um, to the extent that um, those development teams end up developing things that should be in the scope economy. In other words, they're developing reusable components that then maybe are consumed by other development teams. They are actually distracted from the creation of novel value because what they end up doing is maintaining uh, the, the, the libraries and functions and operations of a shared resource. Um, and that distracts them from this kind of really razor knit focus on what customers want. In the scope economy, what we're trying to do is create enabling constraints. So this is an idea that um, if we reduce the variation in the system, we can increase the variety of the output of the system, uh, uh, which is kind of a tricky way to say that like, if you can stay in control of uh, the development process, you can actually create more different uh, net, uh, options deploy into the marketplace. To the extent that you, you are out of control, your, your system has low quality or has high variability, uh, you also at the same time limit the number of options you can deploy in the market just because it costs so much to um, maintain these various systems. Um, and also you want this kind of focus on self-service. So, so the teams should be able to both kind of submit patches to be uh, put into a system, of a shared system, so using some sort of uh, inner source theory, um, or uh, 
be able to access infrastructure and, and infrastructural components. Um, finally, uh, we get the scale economy. Um, and the scale economy is really focused on kind of that reliable compute network and storage primitives. So really focused on managing um, a set of economic uh, requirements that actually extend uh, outside of your organization. So for instance, there's almost no organization in the world other than maybe Apple or Google who are going to define the economics of uh, Moore's law or define uh, how, when to update uh, your network for like from 4G to 5G. Uh, or define uh, the cost of compute or the speed of uh, network storage, right? All of those things are uh, at such a large scale that your organization is primarily kind of saddled with managing vendor relationships and making sure that you're efficiently um, acquiring and deploying those types of resources. So that's your scale economy. Again, we kind of get this idea of Flexibility, adaptability, and standardization. And when we look at the scope economy, what we're really trying to focus on is this kind of increase in resilience and use of something called uh, recombining. So, what what is what is recombining? What do we what do we what do I mean when I say recombining? So, one of the things that we see in a lot of organizations is if they don't have a concept of three economies, if they don't have a concept of this scope economy. That means that the resources that they have been developing or purchasing um, are deployed into only one of the two economic theories that they currently have. And the result of that is that when we go in and we try to can talk to people about the importance of scope economy is that we end up having to point out to them that often the resources that they already deploy are probably being suboptimally managed by the wrong economic theory. So they're actually they're, they're using the wrong economic idea to manage the resource. And when I mean wrong, what I mean is that they're not, the, the economic theory they're using is not optimized for what they want to get out of the system, right? And so, for instance, uh, in differentiation, I kind of gave an example already of a team that might um, create a resource uh, data structure, some sort of function. Um, that then other teams in the organization want to have access to. And so then that team ends up being saddled with not only focusing on the customer, but also focusing on servicing other parts of the organization, other, part, other teams in the organization. Um, and so the economic theory of accelerate differentiation and really focus on customer um, novel needs uh, ends up being uh, difficult to do because the team is now being split uh, with their focus, right? So, so in that case, we would want to move or recommon uh, those those types of resources into this uh, scope economy. And the second one would be um, parts of the organization or, or things inside the organization that um, have been moved into the scale economy. Um, often, I see this, uh, frankly, as uh, people who try to do things like uh, master data or, or things like that, where they want to really heavily govern the data structures um, or or um, access to um, uh, patterns. So again, uh, a really strict utilization of uh, reference architectures without any attempt to kind of negotiate or understand the value of differentiation. Uh, so these things end up being, instead of managed in a scope style, uh, end up being managed in the scale style. And the result of that tends to be um, that organizations adopt a push mechanism as opposed to a pull mechanism in order to get them into place. So uh, your enterprise architects pushing reference architectures on teams as opposed to negotiating uh, the best uh, outcome uh, using something like a scope economy. So again, the recombining here would be to determine which parts of the organization, which which parts, which things, which resources inside the organization have been uh, kind of put into a scale-based uh, economic theory and move them back into a scope-based economic theory. So uh, recombining really is kind of three steps: understand the nature of the different resources, uh, understand the difference kind of between consumability, re reproducibility, and, and differentiation, really kind of be able to understand why each of these economic theories 
uh, optimizes for, for the nature of the resources being managed as opposed to um, some other theory. Um, determining the appropriate economic rationality, so figure out which economy to put them in, and then actually kind of governing uh, and negotiating the movement of the resources from one of these economies to another. So, transformation, two acts. Uh, your digital transformation uh, is, should involve re recognizing and realigning around the three economic frames and then recommoning uh, your misplaced resources. So that's great, and everybody's going to run away from this, and it's going to be great, and you'll all have instant success with transformation, right? Well, 70% of all digital uh, transformations fail. It, uh, this is just a super common thing that uh, transformations are not being successful. Um, and there's huge amounts of resources uh, being uh, deployed in order to get these things to work. Um, and, and what we see when we look at this is that we see there's five primary sources of failure in these transformations. Uh, leadership preventing change, uh, product not building things, not listening to customers well enough, not having that feedback loop, not being able to see what the customers want. Uh, development, building the wrong things. Architecture, uh, building things wrong. Um, and finally, operations overly focused on incidents and out outages. Um, so we can turn that upside down and say what we want to have happen during a transformation. A transformation uh, really requires these five elements to be in place in order to be successful. Uh, we need executive sponsorship and kind of the, the uh, ability for uh, leadership to create the space uh, for the transformation to occur. We need product to really understand um, strategic requirements. So to understand not only kind of the rapid, um, rapid fire uh, uh, kind of feature war theory of uh, product development, but actually be able to extend their kind of time frame to understand uh, strategy and deploy strategically. Um, development needs to deliver the right features at the right time. Architecture needs to really make it, make doing the right thing with the architecture easy. So again, less of the push system, more of the pull system, really getting uh, developers uh, product and operations to understand the value of the architecture. Um, and finally, uh, operations uh, needs to focus on keeping those systems running smoothly um, so that uh, people uh, who are consuming the, the um, resources that operations provide uh, assume by default uh, that the system will be uh, kind of continuously available. Even, even though behind the curtains, uh, often operations is, um, constantly working to make those things available. Um, it's really critical when you, when you think through this part to understand that uh, these aren't roles, right? Um, these are capabilities the organization needs to have. Uh, having someone in the architecture role does not mean you have architecture. So most organizations have these kind of roles in-house. They, they think that they have people who are assigned to these five different areas, um, but many organizations still do not have these capabilities. Um, and so one of the things we think about this um, is that part of why they don't develop these kind of, um, these kind of capabilities well is because there's a misbalance between the um, investment in the various areas. So kind of a really quick uh, version of this would be um, transformation often occurs uh, by first hiring an agile, agile group to come in and help your development team develop stuff faster, right? I need more features faster, more agile, more responsive to my customers, better feedback loops with my customer. Uh, that happens and your your development teams actually produce software significantly quick, faster, um, often of higher quality. Uh, but then the uh, operations team with that wall of confusion theory uh, becomes overwhelmed by the rate of change. The, the practices that they had for managing occasional deployments do not work well 
uh, with frequent deployments. And so then you kind of have that DevOps moment where you kind of try to balance the developers, the operations people. At some point during your development, uh, during your DevOps journey, you come to recognize that the architecture, the way that you've architected your systems uh, as you move to the cloud, um, as you move towards a platform-based, uh, container-based system, it's not architected in a way that allows you to accelerate both development and operations at the same time. So now, we're, now we have like a third kind of challenge to overcome, which is kind of the architecture uh, being kind of brought in and made uh, to work in a way that allows this new way of working. And then finally, if you get all three of those things aligned, then product needs to actually recognize that, that what they've made is a faster Gatlin gun, but they then they need to put a good scope on it and make sure that they're focused on uh, kind of grabbing the most value out of the market uh, as possible uh, without just kind of willy-nilly firing bullets down downstream. Um, so. One of the things to say is that, like, in this five-element theory, you need to balance things correctly. The other is to say that those three different or four different transitions, those four different kind of challenges, are highly predictable. And one of the ways to lower the cost, lower the cost of moving through those transitions is to know that they're going to occur and balance your investment across all five of these areas from the beginning. So don't wait until the challenge occurs, but instead uh, bring these people along for the journey the whole way. So create the conditions that make the transformation possible um, and create the conditions that make the transformation inevitable. And so that, that uh, means that these five elements pieces, right, which are kind of about kind of social practice and, and the way that we work together, needs to be overlaid with the technical uh, economic theory that we, we had in the beginning, right? What we need is the ability for our organizations to understand how these five elements um, are, are, are applied across these three uh, economic theories in order to create uh, value faster. And what we call this is kind of platform as an interface. And the idea is to replace the wall of confusion with, with a platform. Um, and so uh, Dr. Demeje says that platforms uh, can be understood as a way of redefining uh, binary relationships to create a middle mass. Um, and thus, uh, we can recommon uh, resource management through negotiation. So again, the use of the scope economy is the place in which those balance of those different pieces becomes negotiated as opposed to becoming a uh, zero sum game. So uh, one example of this would be to adopt something like OpenShift um, and understand uh, the value of things like continuous uh, compliance and uh, Kubernetes as a way of creating a set of enabling constraints that accelerates uh, the development of differentiation while isolating uh, the efficiency that is required uh, on the other side. Um, and then the second step might be recombining different pieces of your organization's resources into your platform. So uh, to finish up, uh, when we think about these three economies, uh, we're trying to manage for different value. Um, we're trying to enable the management of different value inside the same organization. Um, when we're looking at scope economies, what we really want teams to do is be really thin. Uh, we want them to like not create huge amounts of code because we want a lot of it to be disposable. Uh, things that don't work should be killed quickly. Um, and as an organization, uh, uh, when you do product development, you should be able to pay to learn. But you do need to be able to uh, kill things quickly. So that pile of proof of concepts that's running still is a sign that you, you aren't able to manage that economy yet. We need to really kill off uh, things that aren't effective. When we look at the scope economy, though, we're looking at accelerating adoption. Really, uh, we're creating profits here by increasing the value of, of reusable components by making them more accessible and increasing the adoption of those things across your organization. And finally, uh, when we look at scope economy, we're really focusing on that efficiency 
based on the theory that the top line or the you know the marginal cost of your uh, resources is not something that can be changed, but the management of those resources is something that can be changed, and therefore you can create efficiencies. And that is my presentation. Thank you guys for having me. Fantastic, fantastic, Jade. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, see if you are able to get to the share button on the interface and uh, stop sharing the presentation so that they can see us on the on the big screen. There you go. You got it. Thank you very much. So as you were presenting, we had uh, a number of questions come in, and uh, we're gonna pose them to you right now. The first one, let me get the questions on my main screen here. The first one came from, um, got it. from Antonio Urquiza. And Antonio says, hello, Jabe. I believe that the pandemic is forcing a trade-off between the two economies in order to achieve resilience. Uh, I appreciate your thoughts as to whether organizations will accelerate the resolution of such a trade-off. I do. I, I think I think he's hit a lot of good terms there. I think one of the things that I like to talk about is that uh, your scale-based economies can only ever produce reliability. They can't produce resilience. Resilience is a process or a way of being that uh, – that is created by human beings interacting with technology. Um, and so the resilience actually comes from people being able to kind of cope with change. So uh, reliability has to do with purely kind of me mechanical, mechanistic, uh, probabilistic theories of how, how reliable a system will be. Resilience, the ability to adapt to and absorb change, that, that's something you can only get from a development of a scope economy, I, in my opinion. Uh, so. Uh, to the extent that we have kind of these big impacts that are coming from change right now and the really accelerated impact of something like COVID um, is, is, is highlighting the organizations that developed uh, kind of the ability uh, to be resilient, those are the organizations that are being most, most, the most successful. The organizations that, that are, have failed to become resilient are the ones that are having the hardest time right now. So. To the extent that you're interested in those things, uh, what my studies would show is that the, the, the development of these kind of platforms, where a platform isn't just the technology, but the, the combination of human negotiations of need and technology together in order to create a common set of resources, that, that's the way that people are going to be able to accelerate out of this uh, into, into the new normal that we get afterwards. Very good, very good. Uh, Mercedes poses has some commentary about uh, capabilities and uh, and, uh, and she says that most companies have roles but not always have the the needed capabilities and uh, she 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 has a bit of commentary on that and her question is how do you assure that you get both um, you know these capabilities and and the roles uh, at, at the companies to to carry forward this digital transformation? Sure. Um, so I think when, when you look at organizations, one of the things that I see when, the, the, uh, when organizations become heavily role-based is that they assign responsibility for specific functions in the organization to specific people. Um, the things that we tried to point out, things like product management, uh, development architecture, and operations are not things that one person can do by themselves, not even a team of people can do it by themselves. It is across the organization that something like architecture occurs. So you, you, an architect cannot do architecture, architecture. The development team and the operation team are required to be involved in creating the actual end result, right? the architecture that actually exists. So when I usually think about this, there's two things that I tell people that I think are critical. One is to take what's what I call a crew-based theory, which is whenever you're designing a role, design the role's relationship to other roles. Who, who will you be responsible, not just for uh, kind of telling what to do, but instead, who will you be responsible for negotiating uh, the, the thing that you're responsible for uh, with? And, and the second thing is just to say, um, so, so that's a crew-based theory. The second thing is just, 
when you're measuring your transformation uh, as a manager of those people, uh, measure the number of peer-wise conversations that are occurring at multiple layers inside your organization. So the, the more you see peers talking to each other um, and, and kind of discussing uh, what needs to happen, discussing strategy and tactics together, especially if those peers uh, report up into different parts of the organization, the more uh, likely your transformation is gonna be successful. Uh, and that, that's just simply because the lower down in an organization you go, uh, the minute a conflict starts, uh, and they can't resolve it themselves, uh, the conflict will bubble up in the organization until you hit the join point in the organization where those two teams kind of come together on that org chart. And that person will be asked to resolve the conflict. And often they simply don't have the information required to make a good decision. So by, by, by increasing peer-wise communications and increasing the ability to have productive conflict and productive uh, negotiations lower in the organization. You not only increase and distribute decision making, but you increase the ability to make good decisions. Very good, very good. Uh, the next comment in question is um, is related to a very powerful statement you made that uh, that you have to create the conditions that make the transformation inevitable. Um, the question is, how do you create those conditions? Yeah. So I think. Um, this, it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good question. It's a challenging question. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is that in most organizations that I work with, um, there's already a set of conditions in place. So you could think of like conditions can include things like the way that your current service now works, the, the, the processes that you have in place, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the policies and, and um, theories that are inside your organization. And I like to point out to people that all those things are usually put in place uh, to prevent people from doing things that would be dangerous to the organization. And part of the idea of adopting new technology and trying to advance the organization through IT is, is in theory to create new possibilities that are safe. So there's a conflict here. Uh, you get uh, a set of policies that are designed to stop you from doing things and you adopt a set of technologies that are supposed to enable you to do new things. And when these things come in conflict, you get a, this kind of lack of ability for the organization to respond to, to the change. So uh, a really simple version of it. Uh, how many organizations had a set of policy for managing rack and stack servers that applied that same policy to VMs and is now applying those same policies to containers, even though the technologies are radically different and actually are trying to enable completely different behaviors. So the first thing is to really understand that there already are a set of conditions inside your organization. The tools um, and policies that you enable your organization to have, those conditions are what create culture and, and things like that in your organization. So part of it is to really re-examine as you adopt new technology, those previous policies, those previous ways of operating and processes to make sure that they're in alignment with the new technology that you adopted. And the second thing is to really honestly recognize that if you uh, imagine your IT organization being fang-like in any way, being kind of one of these big uh, kind of Facebook, Apple, Google people, you need to recognize that all of them have this scope economy as an internal platform where these things get negotiated. And that is a huge, huge uh, benefit for those organizations. So really adopting uh, an ability to manage across these three technology uh, things it is part of making sure that these conditions are in play. And that means adopting, I think, technologies and processes in alignment with that scope economy. That's terrific. Uh, I, I have to say that uh, the, 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 the quote that you had about uh, progress and paradox is very powerful. Um, you know, on, my, on our own experience working with hundreds of, of organizations, we have found that the great enduring organizations of our time, they are masters of contradictions, uh, where we have these forces pulling very different directions. And uh, we, we often say that the world of greatness is an end world not an or world because about how you bring these contradictions together and you have done a really good job of showing that in the context of the free economies. Um, now, uh, a very last question here, there's a very practical question, Jade, is, um, is 
more of a practitioner's perspective. Uh, what technologies yep. right now you see are ready for prime time? Uh, they are really accelerating digital transformation and creating this proportional value today. So, um, you know, I, I, I work for a technology provider. So, I, I, you know, I think OpenShift uh, is providing huge value for organizations that are adopting it well. I, I think along with that, things like uh, SRE and DevOps practices aligned with those technologies are the things that are really unleashing things for people right now. One of the things I tell organizations right now is that a lot, a lot of organizations have spent a good deal of time and money over the last 20 years investing in Agile, and they're frustrated that they aren't getting the returns that they expected on it. They're not getting that explosive differentiation that they were expecting. And one of the things I point out is that by adopting these kind of platforms and these platform teams and plat pr platform practices, you're literally unleashing the investment that you had in Agile because now you can actually do the thing that Agile describes, which is small, lightweight teams pursuing a specific market for a specific customer while unleashing them from the maintenance of common resources that the organization needs to have in order to do those things. Um, so I think that's that to me, really understanding um, that and the nature of kind of like infrastructure platform and, and application operation, uh, that is uh, the thing that I think is really causing the most kind of impact right now. I think, I think Kubernetes is a generational impact technology that is going to have a huge impact on the market. Jabe, thank you so much for joining us today, sharing your thought leadership and also providing this very practical perspective uh, about technology in the, in the digital transformation context. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Jose. Thanks for having me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, concludes our, our segment. And uh, in our next segment, at the top of the hour, uh, we are going to meet with Dr. Matthias Kirchmer. And he is going to talk about process-led digital transformation from priority to value. Do not want to miss the session. Wraps up the the the, the day with a with a wonderful uh, journey onto um, value creation and uh, and understanding what a process-led digital transformation truly looks like from a global expert. So look forward to seeing you at the top of the hour. And uh, bye for now.